Okay, let's try it again. <laughs> now you, um, <coughs> so growing up, you you ended up in the service before the war, or did you wait till the war started? Uh, no, uh, Wes and I were looking for jobs, <coughs> <coughs> and we were just picking strawberries and raspberries, and the last the last weed was we were out there pick, picking gooseberries, you know, and they got those thorns on them. You got to stick your hand in it. Draw it out. Well, at the end of the day, you were just all prickled up, you know. In a way, we got to talk, and Wes said something about joining the Army. And both of us had been in the guards before. Yeah, and I thought, well, that doesn't sound too bad. I says, okay, let's go out and see. So we did. That was the worst thing we did. <laughs> Anyway, we signed up at Fort Lewis, and they sent us down to Fort Winfield Scott. And... We got good training down there. That time, the, most of the sergeants were around 50 years old, and they're kind of rough characters, you know, and they made you behave. Anyway, we got good training, and then we came up to Fort Lewis, and we stayed here about four or five months, and then we went to Alaska at Fort Richardson outside of Anchorage. And all we did up there is built roads and gun positions. And uh, then we had a split up. And Wes and them went to Nome. And I could have went too, but I was talking to some of those airfield people, and they said, you don't want to go up there. There's nothing there. And that's true. Even today, there's nothing. And uh, in a way, Wes went, and a couple of years later, we all came back to the States. How old were you about when you got in? Are you uh, still pretty... I was just, just 18. So two young kids. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, I guess so. Anyway, we went down to California and then down to, to Texas, El Paso. And I went to school there for about seven or eight months. I took a college course in, in electronics and things like that. And then Wes signed up for uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, a jump shoot. And uh, I followed him. And uh, we both made our jumps, and then the Battle of the Bulge came. And they took us right now and shipped us back over there. So Wes left before I did, or at least I thought he did. We never have put it together. But uh, I was on the SS America, which is the biggest ship America had. And we went to Glasgow, and from Glasgow we went to Blythe, or uh, Bristol. And from Bristol we got a little ship and went straight into La Havre. They were still fighting at La Havre. And, of course, everything was blown apart there in the docks, and ships were sunk, and, and uh, anyway, we bypassed, bypassed that part, and the two, about two days later, we were in Luxembourg, and I joined Patton there, and uh, I stayed with him for about, uh, well, I was on the front 120 days, wow. so seen a lot of action. Didn't do anything glorious or anything. Uh, I did what I was supposed to do, that's all. What's that like for, because uh, here's this young kid from Washington, and now you're traveling to other countries and all that, and not only to a new country, but now you have come into um, a war zone. What's that like for a young kid? Well, you did your job. And over there, we never got passes, you know. But over in Anchorage, we got passes. We got one pass a month. But uh, <coughs> I don't know. I had a squad, you know, and I led a squad through most of the time over there. So, What was your job? What were, what were you supposed to be? I was the infantry. So we did a lot of walking. And we had a platoon of tanks with us most of the time, so we rode tanks, too. And uh, I've seen a lot of action. Now, when you were there, because um, one, I, I see pictures of the soldiers, pretty full load you're carrying with you all the time. Not really? No. <laughs> you had to pack that stuff all the time. That's what I mean. I had, I had a little bag about that big on my back. Had two rolls of ammunition, a belt of ammunition, and two in my 
boot tops, a couple grenades, and a spoon and a knife and a fork, <laughs> and that was it. Because <coughs> you were walking with that stuff, and you just didn't carry it, that's all. You slip in your clothes, and, you know. In fact, baths were very few and far between. I think uh, at one time there, I'd had three baths in 120 days. And, you know, we never had deodorant or anything like that, or never... Everybody smelled the same, and you didn't know it. And it amazes me today that it could be that way. And uh, I can remember being in Argonian Forest, and the snow was about this deep, and my feet were just freezing. And this Ted Newman, he says, uh, he says I was really complaining. I says, I just can't feel nothing. He says, well, we were in a hole, you know. We had a poncho over and a candle between our legs to keep us warm. And... Uh, Anyway, he says, I'll take your shoes off and rub your feet till you get them, a, get them alive, which he did. And I thanked him, and I says, well, I'll take yours off. He says, no. He says, you can't stand the smell. <laughs> I never said a word. <laughs> and I did. I always remembered that. That Ted was about, I was 24 then. And he was 28. We called him the old man. No. But we learned a lot from him, too. He'd been there a long time. Was that your foxhole? Did, did, did you a have a... Foxhole buddy, we called him. So were you always, uh, always had the same... No. I had a... Uh, I started out with Ted, and then uh, we took a, quite a beating some night, so they give us extra fellas. And I got a guy named Glenn Stone after that. And uh, Glenn had a lot of bad luck, really. Uh, we were coming into a village one night, and we could hear the tanks down below us. I guess they could see us, but we couldn't see them. We could hear them. And anyway, finally, they shot some flares up. And Glenn, uh, everybody, they treat you different and teach you different. But when you, anytime you had a flare or something, you really hit the dirt. You know, and he stood up, and they, they caught him in the legs and blew his legs off. And uh, uh, then he started crying and hollering, and I told him to shut up. And he says, well, don't leave me. I says, we won't leave you. Then away, uh, Ted and I picked him up and carried him down the road as far as we could. And the first house we hit, we ran into a first medical station. And we put him in there, and Hank took care of him. And I, get, I went back about an hour later or so, and... He was standing, you know, as straight as he could. And, uh, of course, his other leg, well, the, when I carried him, this part of the bone was just sticking out, you know, and that's all I had. And he says, don't put my leg in the dirt. You know, <laughs> gee. Anyway, it's, uh, I can always remember that parts of it. But we lost a lot of men, you know. And we seen, uh, it just seemed like, Two or three would go here, two or three would go there. Pretty soon, you know, they got, got new faces again. So, uh, and I can only remember Ted Newman and Glenn Stone. I can't remember the names of the other fellas. Did you know what happened to those two? I got, I got a set of books from uh, the Third Army and, and all that, and it doesn't show their name in there. It doesn't show my name in there. The guys that got wounded and came back to their outfit, then your name would be in the book. But if you didn't come back, you were deleted. Wow. So. How do you, how do you, because, you know, I would imagine prior to going over to the war, if I had told you you were going to be taking care of somebody that had had their leg shot and in that amount of pain, that you would have thought, I can't do that. Well, I don't think he was in any pain, you know, because they just blew the legs right off, you know. Uh, they fired at us quite a while. I know when Ted and I were running down the road, they were still firing. And uh, they didn't, they got close to us, but finally he let up and they left. I don't know if they run out of ammunition or what. <laughs> uh, I know uh, he didn't cry or anything, so. And we came back and talked to him. Of course, they had them all hopped up then. But, but uh, 
I never did hear what happened. And I looked in these books trying to find uh, Ted's name in there, and I couldn't find it either. I figured he got hurt too. What do you remember sitting in, in a foxhole? What you would talk about, or did you talk? Oh, we talk about a few things. We mostly plug up the holes so the water wouldn't creep in. <laughs> no, we got pretty good at digging holes, so I can say that. We'd back to back, and then we'd turn and we'd have a hole dug and nothing flat. And I can't remember, like over here, we got a lot of rocks. And over there, I can't remember having any rocks at all. It's just good old plain dirt. You know. And later on, I was on the third tank to cross the Rhine River. So we didn't do nothing. The Germans were over there watching us, but they didn't open up. But we had a lot of tanks coming over that bridge. That was that old railroad bridge they forgot to blow up. They were going to and didn't. In a way, I was on the third tank going across. Well, my outfit was right with us. So. so, and you knew they were watching you? Oh, right? you could see them. They were on those big stone buildings up there. They were standing up watching us. They didn't shoot, so we didn't shoot. And in the Siegfried Line, that happened to us, too. We got trapped in there at one time. In a way, they had a position here and a position there, and we were down here. And we watched him for quite a few days, and then one of our fellows took a shot at him. And after that, you couldn't even move that door. And it was just nothing but bullets. And we used to sneak down at night and take our canteens down and fill them up with water and <laughs> sneak back in. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, finally we made a, a retreat, I guess a gentle retreat, and got out of there. But uh, we seemed to, it's just something like a code that you went by, you know. You, just, you don't shoot me, I don't shoot you, you know. But other than that, if we met face to face, it was either you or him, you know. It's interesting because you talk about that code, which isn't a written code. It just is a something you do. And there is kind of this, I guess, surreal aspect of war in that way that there is still two humans at certain times, but then at times it's friend and foe, enemy and. Well, really, most of the time it wasn't man to man. It was like screaming memes, any aircraft fire and stuff like that. The screaming memes I hated, they, uh, till you really got used to them, you couldn't tell if they were coming in or not. But when they, all of a sudden, if the noise disappeared, you better have yourself planted in the hole because they were getting close. And, and uh, as far as men against men, it didn't happen very often. So I you... shot a few myself, but uh, most of them were quite a ways away, half a block or a block. But they were coming against us, so. And that's, a, I, I mean, I logically understand that part that, I mean, I'd be the same way. It's either me or, either the or me, and let me tell you, I'm going to be protecting myself. Uh, does your mind have to go into a different place to be in a war? No, I mean, you just kind of, I don't know, it's just like it was built into you. I would say that. That's a long time ago. I've thought about a lot of things that we did. And, and uh, Germans weren't too uh, uh, lenient in what they did, too. They had wooden bullets and all that kind of stuff. And, and you find that and you make you really think, if you got hit with a wooden bullet, I don't know what would happen. I never seen one get hit with one, but we found them. You know, clips of them here and there. But they're screaming memes. I got to tell you about the screaming meme. This Ted and I were, you know, the snow was all oh, really deep, and we dug a big hole and trying to keep warm. And anyway, I told Ted, I said, we'd put a, a kind of a, picked up some brush and logs and stuff and put over the top. And we just had one little entrance. And these shot these screaming memes over there. And 
A few of them were duds, and I told Ted, I'm gonna go over there and look at them. So I went over and got one, and I brought one back. And I cut the head off of it, and dumped all the powder out of it, and then got down there and cleaned out the bottom, cut a hole in it, and I had a, you know, they had fins, you just set it up, and it was about this high. So I was gonna make a stove. So, you know, this is, and we were on this hill, and this is nighttime. And the Germans were down below in a village down there, and we were supposed to go in there and get those guys, you know. Anyway, uh, I set this thing on fire, and gee whiz, it was really nice. We just had a little fire going, and all of a sudden it started making this funny noise. And anyway, within a couple of minutes, the flame was coming out of it about this high in the middle of the night. And you know, dark is dark. When there is no light, it's like going in a closet. Well, anyway... We had a, a, a lot of talk yelling at us guys, and we finally got that dumb thing out. And the whole outfit had to move. We moved down in that village down there, but in the meantime, the Germans had moved out, so we, it did help. But uh, those guys were just screaming at us. But it was just funny. It, it, it just started like a candle and just lo- like a rocket, you know. Ooh, and the flames are coming up about this high in the middle of this hill up there. I don't know what they thought, but I, uh, I know I wasn't too happy with what I did. <laughs> you got but, that, that moment of warmth, but... Uh... Yeah, well, I forgot about being cold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was one of the funny things, though. For those of us that have never been in a foxhole, how big a place do you dig when you dig a foxhole? Just for you, and just enough room for you to get in, and so you can sit down. And your head, head'll be about even. Otherwise, and then you just you bundle up. Your his his feet's here, and your feet is there. You have a candle between us, and one guy's got his head out the poncho, and the other guy's sleeping. When he gets uh, tired, well, he your turn. <laughs> so you changed. You just keep. And I assume sleeping means just... That's just nighttime. We didn't do that in the daytime. So. But I mean, it's sitting up just... Yeah. Oh, you could go to sleep anywhere. If they stopped, you were asleep. That's my dad said. That's the one thing you learned in the service was to sleep anywhere. Yeah. And if you had a moment, you slept for a couple minutes. Yeah, you? that's right. Huh. He's correct. I just can't imagine, because you're cold, wet... Muddy, snowy, it, it doesn't sound like a pleasant experience. Or is there so many other things going on that your mind, again, lets you overlook some of that? Or are you constantly thinking, oh, man, I'm wet, I'm cold? Well, you, most of all, you thought of food. Wherever you go, and make, if you went into a house and they had any food there, you got it. And most of those Germans had a chimney. In the top of the second floor, they had a little opening there, and they put their meat in there, and they smoked it. And we caught on very fast. That's, uh, I know it's wrong, but we did it. But we were hungry, too. Those little uh, boxes of food, they didn't last very long. And, you know, and you got the same stuff all the time. There's always cheese and a sandwich, you know. In a way, it wasn't too good. But... Wasn't much booze, a little bit here and there. And if you did get a drink, you just passed it down the line. And so after you get up there, about 10 people, there wasn't any left. So <laughs> you only got one drink. <laughs> did, you, did you find beer sometimes in houses or wine? or? I found quite a bit of beer, dark beer. And it's good beer. And uh, a lot of champagne. Uh, I found a little whiskey, but not very much. No. But I didn't drink very much then any, anyway, so. Well, you just didn't do it, that's all. Now, I've talked to a lot of people that didn't smoke before the service, but they started smoking while they were in the service. Were you a smoker in the service? Oh, yes, that yes. Time. And they, they always gave us cigarettes. We always had plenty of cigarettes. And you always had a Zippo lighter. And if it was run out of fluid, you know, you tied a string and dropped it into the gas tank and filled it up. (laughs) That's how you got your fluid.
Probably got a good flame off of it with that oh, type of fuel. Yeah, it smoked a little bit, but it did the job. So, yeah, I often think of those old Zippos. Now they're about forty dollars for a, a fancy Zippo. I was looking at them the other day, and Frank smokes. I thought about buying them one of those Zippos, and I changed my mind. Yeah, he got money money instead, so he's better off. Now you when. Um, when you'd be moving with the tanks, uh, would you crawl up and ride on them sometimes? Oh, we ride on back. Yeah, yeah, that's where the motors were. That they kept you warm, you know. Well, some of the guys would get up in front, but most of the time we're riding back. I always tried to find over the vents over there and ride in the back. Well, you get a platoon of guys on a tank, it, uh, you've got a lot of men all over it. And they'd run up to the next village, and then they'd let you off, and you'd go in. Then if you had uh, a little, you know, back talk out of them, then they'd open up with their tanks, and then you'd go back in. So, it, you know, you're working. And then, they, like, like one squad would be leading first, you know, and he'd be leader for a day, and then the next day the next squad would be it. See, if you had four squads there in a platoon, well, uh, every fourth day you'd be back up again. So... You know, it isn't just one guy all the time. And you would go in and, and uh, uh, if the Germans were still there, you would roust them out of the villages. We'd try to. Keep pushing them. Yeah. Sometimes it got tough and we'd bypass them. You know. Were the villages usually fortified or was it just uh, a German here and there hidden in the buildings? Well, they're just stuff. They weren't, uh, they were I never run into a, a, a regular fort or anything like that. It's just villages. We'd drive them out. That's about it, really. Now, you, I'm trying to remember my notes right. You had a pretty um, hairy experience there, if I remember right, in one German village. Oh, you mean when I got hurt? Yeah. Oh, well, I came, we came into this village, and we, they, uh, they sent us back quite a bit, and then finally we had to disperse and come back in, you know, from both sides. And we got in there, and we got in a, a good foothold, and then we were just moving them out. Then away, Ted and I were running from place to place like you do, and you have a couple over here and a couple there, and then there, you know, you have people going all over and making their way. And we come to this great big gate, and... These Germans had fired at us for quite a while there. And their ber Berettas, they used to have 50-round clips. And I could see those bullets just hitting the dirt alongside of you, you know. And you're laying in the dirt, and they were firing it. I don't know why they missed us. We were just in a string, and you could, one guy ahead of me got hit in the hand. He says, I'm a lucky stiff. He says, I get to go home. <laughs> anyway, I... After we got in there, I opened up this gate, and there was two, two Germans there with a bazooka, and they fired, and they hit me in the cartridge belt with a bazooka. And all it did, it didn't go off. It just drove me back, but it broke my intestines inside. And I walked for eight hours, and then I, finally I couldn't walk any longer, and they got me to the medics and put me together. And then later on, when I was in Belgium, I got gangrene, and... Uh, all my intestines come out my stitch hole down there. And they took me in there and I watched him and he was pulling it out and it was all black and he just cut it off. And you know what I'm thinking, well I'm gone, you know. <laughs> but he said, well you'll be all right for a while but this is all I can do for you. And uh, after that they built a dam around me and I never went to the bathroom for four months. You know, it just run out all over. Yeah, it was a heck of a way to live, but I lived. And uh, then they operated and put me together, and a month I was home. So they did that over at uh, Spokane. So where, when you were four months, where were you? Was that in Belgium? No, I was at Belgium. They operated there, and uh, when I got gangrene, they couldn't do anything for me, and they shipped me to France. And then they put me on a hospital ship, and I went to uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and I flew to uh, Denver, and then I flew to Spokane, and they, they had to build me up because I only weighed 99 pounds. 
And uh, they fed me good food and kept me going. And finally I got up to about 107. They figured I, I could stand it, so they put me together. So Boy. it took a long time. Pretty lucky. Oh, yeah. I mean, not lucky to go those, through that. Those right? guys, I, I was lucky to have those, those people working on me. You know, they were awful good to us guys. I think they're the best in the world, really. They were for me. And I know a lot of other guys, gee, they did worlds. Well, you go out American Lake out there, and it's still terrible to see those guys out there. Some of them are in horrible shape. And uh, I'm happy. Do you, because it was a long time ago, but do you, um, do you have visual recollections of facing the German with a bazooka, or is that something that you... No, I, after he fired that, Ted was right alongside of me, and he, he opened up on it, and he killed both of them right there. No, but uh, they didn't have any more ammunition left. That's all they had. And I happened to be in the road. Boy, that must, I, I mean, not only did it be hit by a bazooka, but it sounds like you were pretty doggone close to him. We were about, from me to you, three feet, and he fired that thing. Otherwise, I think it would have, if it got going, I think it really would have, it would have torn me in half. And it just pick you up and yeah, it puts me put me back about eight feet on on my back. Didn't knock me out. It gave me a stomach ache. So, and then you just marched on for another couple yeah, hours. Yeah, it, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And so, boy, Ted sounds like a good uh, right hand man to have. Oh yeah, he was very strong. Stronger than I was. I I weighed 164 in those days, and I could just about do anything. But he was quite a bit stronger than I was. And uh, anyway, he helped me a lot. Do you, do you know where he was from originally? He's from Chicago. Those people are all from Chicago. That outfit. In a way, we we came up there. We joined them, and and uh, of course, we were all mixed up in a way. You know. Other than that, uh, I've had a real good life, really. What, what was the best part about being in the service during World War II? When I got out. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> the best part? I don't know. I had some good times in the service. I, I married Catherine Hill at, uh, when I came back from Alaska. And we went down to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas together. And then I when. I went back east while she went back home. And then when I got, got out, I only weighed 107 pounds, and I was pretty sick, and I divorced her. I just, uh, uh, I just, I was in a bad frame of mind, I guess. Anyway, Wes married her. And Wes Barcliffe, you know, he's the mayor of Tumwater for years and years, you know. And then away, uh, Wes died about uh, four years ago, I guess, thereabouts. I ran into Catherine, and I'm going with her now again. Isn't that something, huh? Well, what an interesting... So, between Alaska and Europe, you got married. Yes. So when you went over in Europe, you were married. Yes. You came back wounded. Yes. And, and because of, I assume, your injuries and all that, you thought, I don't want to... I couldn't do anything. Yeah. I just couldn't do anything, really. You know, I weighed 107 when they discharged me, and uh, I was having a heck of a time, really. And I went to work for Warehouser down at the ply mill, and I figured that was the best thing to do physically to keep me going, and it almost broke me. <laughs> you know, it's just tough work down there. Anyway, I held on for a couple of years, and then I just kept doing things and started playing ball and doing this and that. And, and uh, I got out the brewery, and I didn't know I had it so good. Isn't that awful? Yeah, I had a good time at that brewery. Well, that shows a real difference, I think, in your generation 
and my generation and the generation of today. Your thought was, I'm hurt, I'm gonna do whatever I can to tough it out and get better. Today they'd say, send me my disability check and let the government take care of me. I'm gonna sit here on my butt and do nothing. You really think it's that way? That's my view of it. Well, I haven't seen it positively that way. I've seen a few people that I think could do a little, little more than they do, but uh, I've got one son that's a pretty smart boy, and he isn't doing nothing. And I don't really like it that I'm taking care of him. Financially, I am. Yeah. The other two boys are doing very well. And Frank's in computers and stuff, and he, uh, he's trying to promote something by sales through the internet and all this. And, uh, it's slow. You know, so your ch did you remarry then? Yes, I, I married a girl named Marsha McCandless. And uh, we were together quite some time. And then we divorced. And then I married uh, Lillian Olson. And that's where I had the three boys, or she had the three boys. She was a very good person, really. It was very good to me. Uh, I never realized how good she was till she passed away. Yeah. And uh, uh, then I re Wes was gone then about that time, and I just happened to be driving past North Street up there, and Catherine was out there, so I swung by and talked to her in the car for a while. I says, I'll call you if you don't mind. So I did, and the first time we got together, we talked till midnight. I couldn't believe it. And then about a month later, I asked her to go out with me, and she says, no, come on over and eat. So we did that, and finally she went out with us. Now we go all over the place. Huh. You know, it's kind of neat. Yeah, wow. And she's a very nice person, too. I don't know if you knew the Hills or not. Merton Hill, he had strawberries out in Johnson's Point. He had 100 acres of strawberries. He had the Olympia Cannery. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah. All right, that's Merton Hill, so that's his daughter. Huh. Don Hill has the Hallmark. Oh, okay. Don Hill just got married to... Yes. Yes, see, and Dad is dating um, Marion's sister, Marge. Really? Yeah. Wait till Catherine hears this. <laughs> Gee, Small that's world. nice. Oh, yes. Huh. Wow. Yeah. I've had some <coughs> very good times in my life. I really have. What was, um, we didn't talk too much about Alaska. What, what were you doing up in Alaska? Building roads? Is that? Building roads and gun positions and stuff like that. We had uh, 15 different places up there. We built gun positions and searchlights and machine guns and small, small caliber stuff. And uh, the guys that went to know them, they did the same thing. I think the only reason they sent those guys to know them is because they thought the Russians were going to come over at that time. And I think they just, it was kind of persuading because the Russians used to fly over, pick up planes, and, and go back. So they, was this pre-Pearl Harbor that you ended in Alaska, or was this after Pearl Harbor? That you after Pearl Harbor. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? I was in Anchorage. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Uh, I, was, I went in in 39, see, and the, and the Pearl Harbor was only in December, what, 41. 41, yeah. So we've been up there quite a while. So and all it was is just a job. We've done everything up there. I've shoveled coal and everything else. And <laughs> Oh, well, I guess that's what we're for. Now, did I hear right that you, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, you came on some big thing that you've really never figured out what it was, a building or uh, some underground thing? Did I, did I hear right on that one? I don't know what you're... So I, maybe I, I have so many interviews that I'm doing, I might have got them mixed up. I, I heard that somebody was uh, up working on a road in Alaska and uh, they came into this area that was out in the middle of nowhere, and there was some military installation or something there. Maybe it was somebody else. Oh, I know. It. Uh, I know, but I never went in there, but we could drive our trucks in this place. And it was outside of Anchorage, 
and then the hills, and I was, I took a shortcut one time to get to Fort Richardson. We were out at Eagle River Flats, which is about 11 miles from Anchorage. And anyway, we took this shortcut, and we were in this valley, and all of a sudden we run into this big hole in the wall. So I, I kind of pointed the truck in there, and they, this was all solid rock, and you could see for blocks in this place. It was just a great big mammoth hole in there. I drove that truck all around in that place, and they had about 10 or 12 guys from the gun position, you know, going in for showers and food, and we were all looking, and we, nobody knew anything about this stuff. And we weren't supposed to be there, I guess, so. But I, I forgot about that. Was I, it, it, it was heated and lights and... They had everything. So like an underground city almost, I mean... Yeah, but there was nothing there, nobody there. It was just open. You, I could have put four trucks into this hole. Wow. You know, it's just a big... They bored into that thing and uh, maybe uh, they figured somebody was going to blast them. That would be their hole, I guess. Did, when you were up there, did you have a pretty good idea that war was coming? No, no, I never had a, not the foggiest. When the December 7th coming, it was about 30 below, and we couldn't even get the truck started. <laughs> we had a few of them, the rest of them, we were towing them around trying to get them going. And the brakes were all froze up on them, you know. And I uh, like the steering, steering in them. We had to pour uh, kerosene in the thing there and stir it around a little bit to get it so you could turn. <coughs> yeah, it was just, uh, we were just flat, didn't know nothing about it. Yeah, that was a, uh, we all went out then. We started, well, we were building these gun positions and that's where we went. So did, was it, um, uh, because with Japan being able to come in that way, was there a big fear up there that you might be attacked or was it? No, it, nobody said anything. They didn't seem to be worried about it. They just, we just went out there and took over your position and that's it. And I had a position that looked over Eagle River Flats, which is about 11 miles out of, out of Anchorage or Fort Richardson. And um, I had a machine gun out there and a searchlight and, and uh, the stuff and power plants to run it. And we built our own cabins and we lived there. What about corduroy roads? Is that oh yeah, the roads, you know, when they, in the summertime, they're nice and dry and they're hard, you know. But when it starts to rain, it's deep ruts like this. So you laid these logs over them and then poured gravel over the top of the corduroy. <coughs> it a lot of work, but it worked. A lot of hard physical work, I assume. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nobody grumbled. We just did it. I bet you were in pretty good shape coming back from well, there. I, I suppose. Uh. Yeah. What was the worst part of being in the service during the war? Oh, boredom mostly, you know. Yeah. Like if you were in a barracks, you weren't doing anything. You know, and they never had enough money. I used to send all my money home. Jeez, peace. Well, I'm glad I did, but I didn't have very much. But uh, those days, gee, we only made 21 six bits that started out. My gosh, that was a lot of money, I thought. I found out how little it went and how far it went. So what did you do to pass the time when you were bored? Gambled? <laughs> Against each other. <laughs> oh, well, you had guard duty and this and that and cooks and you, you know, you, you always had something to do, some maintenance to do. Kept things as neat as you could. So when you were gambling, was there one person that was always winning or did it just kind of keep? It just kind of shuffled around. You might win this week, Joe might win next week. You had to be very careful or you'd go broke. <laughs> yeah. I did very well up there the last couple of years. I watched what I did and sent a lot of money home. <coughs> so. And then when I went over to Europe, I never spent anything, you know. I never had anything to spend. I got, 
They gave me a $10 bill over there in Germany somewhere, told us to go spend it. And I looked at them, the $10 bill, and I looked over there, and these guys are gambling for it. And I threw it out there, and it was gone, just like that. <laughs> so that was the end of my invasion money. Uh. Yeah. But other than that, I had about seven or eight months' pay coming to me when I got, got out. That helped a little bit. Where would you, if you'd spent the $10, where could you have spent it? Was it just at the PX, or? We didn't have a PX. You were out in the field, you know, and they come along and he says, everybody gets $10. So you're paying us and hauling your name. Yeah. When you went through the, this is the one thing that's hard to understand about war. When you went through these villages, the Germans left. Is the village still operating? I oh, mean, yes. They, they didn't. Uh, people did. After you, if you took over, say, three or four of their houses, you know, as billets, you know, and uh, when you left, they just moved right back in. And the bakery opens up again and the... I don't know about that, but they didn't have very much. There was one village we got into, and I don't know what happened, but we got there early, and they set up a kitchen, and they fed a whole bunch of us. And I always thought, uh, I was, always thought maybe they poisoned us, but I, did, I didn't die, so it was all right. <laughs> but they'd fry potatoes, you know, uh, cut it up, fried potatoes and eggs and things like that, and it was very good. On the whole, uh, uh, I didn't run into any real bad people as far as Germans and stuff like that. So it wasn't, because you the, the soldiers would leave often, or you would capture them or whatever, and then the citizens are still there. So you see moms and children and things like that running around the village when you come in? I mean, maybe not running around, but... You Sometimes you would. Kids. Then you'd shoo them in the house because you never knew what was going to happen. But uh, on the whole, uh, they just stayed indoors, you know, until it was over. So you didn't see a, 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 a disdain or a hate for the American soldiers coming through, or did you? I never did. So... Because it sounds a lot different than some of the things we face today within the Middle East that we're going to be facing because there's this definite uh, Americans are evil and bad. Where this was, it sounds like two countries or groups of people that the Germans, they were in war because of Hitler. Um, they had gone through a recession. They had nothing. But it wasn't that they hated the Americans or anything, it sounds like. No, it was just force against the force. Whoever won, they, they won. That was it. That's the way I see it. Nowadays, I don't know what they got going over there. And I don't understand this terrorism. I think that's terrible. Have you ever gone back to any of the places? No, I'd like to, but I never have. I could. I could now, but I don't want to. No. I was very lucky. Uh, Lil was very good with financing. I wasn't. So she took care of all the stuff. So if I wanted something, like if I needed, one time I blew an engine on the boat, and she says, uh, well, just get us home, and says, buy two new motors and put them in. So I did. Well, they were 5000 apiece, but she had the money. And she took, she invested in non-taxable bonds, like Seattle and Tacoma and all this. And uh, I never realized we had that much money till she died. And uh, I'm not really wealthy, but I'm pretty well fixed. Well, they say behind every great man there's a great woman. No, no, it wasn't that way at all. There was a great woman. <coughs> if it had been me, I had spent it somehow. <laughs> and I know she bought out a fit when I bought that 31 Uniflight. And, you know, and anyway, well, the first, <coughs> first time I told her I was going to get a boat, and I bought a 24 Owens. And we had it for nine years. And I ran into this other boat up there, and the guy would take a trade. And, and I says, well, I think we're going to get it. And she says, well, how are you going to pay for it? I says, you're going to go get a job. <laughs> <coughs> anyway, she did. So we got the boat. We paid for it. It took us 10 years to pay for that boat. You know, I just took over his contract and reassigned it so it would be in our name. Uh -huh. But uh, it was a fine boat, and we had it for 24 years, and I rebuilt it from one end to the other. 
And uh, well, it's like Peter, he, he was in there monkeying with his all the time. Yeah, yeah. That's and they used it a lot. He'd take his wife out to the country club out there and go eat and do this and that. <coughs> Lillian worked out there at the country club. Oh, is that right? What, what, uh... <coughs>